Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dark down for a Hi, it's Jackie Cation, and you are listening to The Dork Forest. The website's JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com if you like a determiner. Let's do the credits. Patrick Brady's going to fix this audio and video. Vilmos works on JackieCation.com, and Mike Rickberg uh, sang the song with his wife, Sarah. He composed it, and he will sing his version of the Mexican hat dance at the end of this show. Thank you so much for listening to The Dork Forest. Here's a scoop. I'm doing stand-up online. A lot of Zoom shows will eventually go back on the road. Sign up for my email list. It's easy to get off. It's harder to get on than it is to get off. And no harm, no foul, if ever bored. JackieCation.com. Sign up for the email list. You'll find out about my weekly Zoom shows and stand-up on the road eventually. You may donate to the show if you would like. I would like. Sure, I would. There's PayPal, Jackie at JackieCation.com. And there is a PayPal button on both DorkForest.com and JackieCation.com. And there's Venmo, if you like Venmo, Jackie-Cation, oddly enough. If you have listened to all of the shows, go to DorkForest.Bandcamp.com, I think. The Dork Forest has a Bandcamp page. You can listen to a, but a lot of ones that are free from pre 2000 nine when i started pre-recording and uh then there's a live episodes that cost me a couple of bucks so i charge you a couple of bucks there's also some stand-up there's a story uh album that's very exciting there and um other than that i have a lot of merch in my garage feel free to order if you know anybody who doesn't have any cds or the dvd and uh you can follow me everywhere at jackie cation let's get into the show Hi, I'm Jackie Cation. I'm in my living room, and I am with another comic from 800 Pound Gorilla, which I will be recording with eventually. But by God, Arthur Gauss. Is it Gauss? Uh, Yes, it is Gauss. Good for me. Uh, Stand-up comic from the Bay Area has an album out right now. Right now. Nice jokes for smart people. It sounds lovely, I have to admit. Yeah, Yeah. um, if you don't like it, it means you either like dumb jokes (laughs) or you're a dumb person. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> Arthur Gauss is throwing down everybody. And uh, what you should know is uh, comedy subjective. I'm sure everyone will like it. And if you want to follow him, it's at maniac underscore bowl, like the Super Bowl, but a ma- he's a maniac bowl. Right. Maniac underscore bowl. It'll be in the notes. And what I find interesting. So this, this 800 pound gorilla album, by the way, is out everywhere now, right? Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Okay. So it's go and. Stream the hell out of it. You can do it. Uh, nice jokes for smart people. Arthur Gauss. That's what we're talking about. Now, uh-huh. here's here's my... Uh, so you dorked him, though. You gave me the most eclectic list of... <laughs> I was like, I need one thing. I need five things. Give me five things, just in case, because we don't know each other. Uh, you yeah. look familiar. Well, we met one time yeah. backstage at San Francisco Sketch Fest, but that's it. Okay. And I was like, I, I'm sure he's plug and play. And I'm sure. But so if I don't know somebody very well, I'm like, I'm going to need five topics. And, uh, <laughs> but, and so, let me just say that this was a small sampling of the topics that I am utterly, utterly dorky about. Uh, this took some editing. Oh, fair enough. Well, uh, <laughs> d- feel free to bore me with the minutia of, first of all, uh, I like, I love history. So let's start with San Francisco where you're from. And the thing that happened in 1915, which I've never heard of. What is it? Okay. San Francisco Panama Pacific Exposition of 1915. Panama. Okay. It took place in San Francisco. 1915, San Francisco was a fraction of the size population-wise, a fraction of the size, um, a fraction of the size, you know, geographically. There were whole places in the city that hadn't been built because they were later landfills. Mm -hmm. And... And but it's it had this outsized clout because if you're on the west coast of the United States, basically it was the biggest city for a long, 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 long time. Right. right. Like L.A. wasn't really a thing yet. It was San Francisco and maybe a little bit Seattle if you were on the west coast. Right. And the but then unfortunately we did build this great city on a fault line, and in 1906 the city both was reduced to rubble and then burned. So oh my gosh, down. that's right, the San Francisco yeah. fire. Yeah, yes. it, it, but it fell down and then the rubble burned. And incidentally, 
there was a guy, they, there, there was a plan for this. They did actually have a plan for this. But the guy who came up with the plan, uh, he was struck by a falling brick and was killed. And then his house burned down. Uh, is your doorbell ringing? I think my doorbell is ringing. <laughs> That's okay, as long as you're willing to ignore it and your loved one will go and get that door. Uh, uh, can, no, my, my wife and the baby are out, uh, which means that, like, it better not be them. <laughs> okay, do you want to run and get it? You can. I can pause this. Let's just pause uh, it. Maybe we should do that. Yeah. Zoom recording. Of course it was Amazon. Well, that's fine. Um, I guess. <laughs> yeah. As, but what I like was the intensity of, no, you have to answer the door right now. And you're like, because they just leave, like, they will throw things over my wall. They don't care. You have a yeah. very earnest Amazon deliverer. No, that was a three. Well, let the record show. Let the audio and discursory record show that that was three doorbell rings. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it. A lot yeah, of and that, happening that, there. She would have kept ringing for the entire hour. It was, we had to knit this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the the fire was in 1906. Yes, and um, and then there was a, there was an earthquake and then a fire and the right. guy who had the the plan, uh, died in said fire or rubble. Yeah, he was cross? hit by a falling brick. The plan was if if there was an earthquake, <laughs> and then a fire. The plan was that they were going to blow up Van Ness Street, just blow it up. Wait. Uh, what I like was, because uh, I thought you were going to say, the plan was, is if there was a fire and an earthquake, we were going to talk to this one guy. <laughs> you would think this, did, why was he the only one who knew? Unclear. <laughs> but, it was the, but the plan was in a safe in his house, reportedly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, which is right where you want to be. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Which I'm sure the safe was very safe. I'm well, sure I once mean, they I, I, unburied it. Well, I mean, let's put this together, though. They later found the safe with the plan intact because they, they opened it up. They found the plan. and was like, that's what we did. That's oh, is that what they did? Yeah, that's what they just blew up Van S Street. Just Why? blew it up. Why? Uh, to keep the fire from spreading any further. OK, so they created it was called, a it was called the Yeah, it was called the ham and eggs fire because like there was this earthquake and everyone was like, wow, I'm going to need breakfast. And then they lit their stoves. So the main gas went up. That's what started the fire. So because all of that was kind of located around Van Estre, all that piping mm. and stuff, they just dynamited it. And it, it was that was to stop the fire from spreading. And did it work? Yep. Okay. All right. And did you grow up in San Francisco? I did. That's why you have this sort of background of information of, like, I, I have a cursory knowledge about the cow in Chicago. Anyway, um, so because I was geographically close to Chicago, and they had yeah. a big fire, so that's right. They were they were fire twinsies in our right. civic. Right, right. The Chicago people are Milwaukee. Uh, when things burn down, nobody writes any sort of poetry about it. Uh, so because I'm I'm from outside of Milwaukee. So yeah, well they have in well they have in Milwaukee they have uh they have plaques about like great shipwrecks down by the river. Oh, do they? Yeah, I mean, I you walk around they're... that with the third ward. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, you walk around there and they've got plaques about like here was a tugboat that sank, but those plucky Irishmen saved ten lives. Yes, you know, uh, made a difference to that starfish. We're not a large city, anyway. Uh, unlike San Francisco, we are not the definitive city of the mil Midwest. <laughs> it, I would not go that far, man. Like there is something er Midwest about Milwaukee. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a gorgeous, uh, it has a lot of, what I like to think about Milwaukee, so there's a lot of potential. It's got a lot of potential to be something. Uh, we could, we could have been something. And until then, uh, we're just going to be ourselves and just keep plugging away. <laughs> Talk to me about, um, so then 1915 happens. Yeah. So San Francisco crumbles, burns, and it's a zoo. I mean, it is a zoo for like 10 years. Wow. Um, the, you know, the, the zoo was literally in Golden Gate Park. They just moved the animals out there. People were living out there. Um, and it was, there's, I mean, it really was a, do we even want to rebuild this kind of question? Wow. And they decide to rebuild it. It's this great civic achievement. It's why San Francisco's flag is um, a phoenix bird. Um, okay. Yeah, the, the slogan is, uh, gold, it's oro, uh, oro and guero, uh, fiera and pax, uh, gold and silver, iron, or iron and war, gold and peace. Okay. And yeah, and it's uh, anyway. The, so the phoenix becomes a symbol of the city, but there's they need to get people to come back here. They need yeah. they need to attract people. They need to yeah. attract tourists. They need to be something. 
They need an event. So they come up with this idea, the Panama Pacific Exhibition of 1915. And it's to celebrate the opening of the Panama Canal. Sure, which is not anywhere near San Francisco. Correct. It's but at the Panama. time, yeah. yeah. But at the time, if you wanted to go from New York to San Francisco, you had to go all the way around down South America or you had to go overland. That's right. And you could go now. Mm hmm. Yeah. Through the, Pan- through the locks. Yeah. If you were it, like a lot, there's a lot of great reasons to go through the Panama Canal uh, smuggling. Money laundering, um, <laughs> cultural rot. <laughs> right, right, right. Just some sort of r- r- random appropriation of whatever you can keep your hands on and jam yeah. into a hold of a ship. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Large scale uh, weapons operations, that sort of thing. Sure. So, but at the at the time, it shaved three months off the trip from New York to San Francisco. Okay. So they're so they're gonna have this big thing, and they decide. Well, not only are we gonna do this big thing. We're going to build a whole neighborhood of, of the city. We're, I mean, like a full on like renovation addition to the city, which is now the Marina District. And they build this thing called the Palace of Fine Arts. OK, right? I have performed in the Palace of Fine Arts. I have seen Hall and Oates at the at Palace the- of Fine Arts. OK, yeah. <laughs> Were they together? It's Hall and Oates, man. Of course they were together. I was just like, you, you, there was such a pause there. I was like, oh, did they have solo careers? I didn't no, know. I'm just, no, I, I mean, like if, I said, if I said I saw Hall and Oates and, and you fired back, like, oh, it was right. just their hall. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, 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 it was Hall no, and no. It was Hall and Oates. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be pre- <laughs> sort of prepared for that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they, they, build the, they build the Palace of Fine Arts, um, which you have performed at, which clearly still a palace of fine arts if they're booking you. Sure. Right? You um, see and, ha- ho- you know, host of many, many outdoor teenage uh, keg parties at the Palace of Fine Arts. Sure. Still the premier location. Um, right. But and so they, they build it. They build this, this beautiful neighborhood and they turn this whole neighborhood into a giant art fair promenade. OK. It's like you got to think like 1915 version of Art Basel. What is Art Basel? It's like this giant art fair that attracts like a bunch of people in various degrees of tastelessness okay. to Miami to purchase art. Okay, so it was Many, a bit of a much free of for all. Terrible. A bit well, of a free me? for all. A free for all? Free for all. Okay. Free for all. And so it's this giant effort to import art from all over the world and bring mm-hmm. it to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And the, the theme sort of develops that this, the Panama Pacific exhibition is truly the meeting of East meets West. Okay. It's the end of the American frontier, and it's the place where Ameri- the Pacific American interacts with the greater world. Okay. And you please believe people had strong thoughts about that. Like half of the American art in, in, the, in the display is like, is like pilgrims being like whipped out of New England and arriving in California where like bare chested women are handing them oranges. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. That's really. an actual where there's where there's so what was there so wait, now let's unpack this a little bit. Yeah, no, is there's there, a lot to unpack. Right. Is there some sort of speculation that California was settled by people who couldn't take they're a little too uptight over in Massachusetts so we're going to strike out for California where it's the, the roads are paved with oranges and gold and boobs why why, why hasn't anyone ever moved to California <laughs> I mean that's the reason right <laughs> I mean, like... I, you know I didn't get the memo I didn't get the memo I understand uh, that that does make some sense though allow me to yeah, that there's some there's some seating. like truthy Americanness there that like you go west to get away from that to arrive at this Right. And there, you can almost hear the Beach Boys playing in the background. <laughs> yeah. And but it's 1915. So who knew that they had this crazy ass attitude back in the day? This has been this is burned in. You're telling me. Yeah. Well, it's, this is sort of the beginning of it as like San Francisco International kooky art city. OK. It's sort right. of the, yeah. It's sort of the beginning of that. And like, you know, and, and also, I mean, the, the art is, like, fantastic. It became this, like, really big exhibition. Like, all of these, all of this new stuff from, from Europe, or the, the, that whole thing that happened in European art where they started imitating 
like stuff from Tahiti and Africa and stuff like that. Oh, when was yeah. that? Well, it's I it's, remember them copying the Greek stuff and the Roman stuff in England. Yeah, and this was sort of there was sort of a shift away from that where they started cop they started kind of Im- imitating stuff that they were seeing in from other parts Africa of the and 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 the Caribbean and stuff like that. And yeah, and like like um uh oh, you know, Tahiti. What's the, uh Oh, um I don't know. Coconuts the, and the, bare-chested ladies are all I'm that's coming to mind with Tahiti. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's the uh, the guy who was friends with Van Gogh and um, Gauguin. Oh, Gauguin. Gauguin. Right. Gauguin. Gauguin. Go, oh, Gauguin. Come on. Don't Gauguin. Gauguin. Man, go, go get out of here, man. Like, <laughs> I, I've had enough of him, man. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, but, like, these, these are the sort of, this was the sort of art that was on display. And it was, like, this really influential art. And, like, you see a lot of the pieces that were on display in the San Francisco international exhibition mm-hmm. and like you recognize them and it's like there was this whole it, it kind of it kind of like sharpened the identity of san francisco as a place you could go to be an artist a place where they appreciated the arts okay and and it's and it's sort Open of it like up. yeah and like much of the art that's collected here in san francisco um and like on display in the museums comes from the panama pacific exhibition and it sort of has this like outsized um, place in the imagination of a lot of San Franciscans, like myself. Okay, and you were raised to sort of think about this Panama American exposition as not just like there was there was this it was the birth of sort of the 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 artistic intelligentsia that made San Francisco to what it was. What was it before then? Was it just a mining facility or a, a place where? You guys had to find the bay. That's what I, I remember that there was hundreds, a hundred years where no one could get into the bay. Yeah. Because of the fog. Well, and... the, yeah, the fog. And there's like the, the bay is where the, you know, this, all this swirling happens and then goes back out to sea. So it's where water, seawater comes in and goes out and it creates a little vortex there. And there were a lot of shipwrecks. Oh, okay. And so, but the, and they couldn't tell where the real mouth of the bay was. It's, for I mean, a long it's, time. it's hard to find. Yeah. It's tricky. Tricks. Yeah, it, it, it's it was, not exactly easy to find. It was hiding. The planet was like, you guys go around. Why don't you guys go around? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Head <laughs> south to Los Angeles. <laughs> why don't you, why don't you uh, go to Monterey or something or <laughs> yeah. drop some stuff yeah. off and then hump it overland like, uh, the, like, the, like the weird beasties you are? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just like, yeah, that looks like more of a Santa Cruz shipment. <laughs> <laughs> right it was like because i i th- and the only reason i know that i think i read some sort of historical fiction where they eventually they were like they put up a sign or a light <laughs> where it was yeah. like, they're like it's here you guys a giant arrow uh yeah, no, there's there's a, there's a there's a there's a couple of lighthouses like they eventually had to put in a bunch of and like that but but it, it's it's not easy to get into the bay and but it was like a there was gold in the north country of course mm-hmm. right and you my know, husband when, grew up in Oroville, which is really Oro. Oro. Yes, that's that's ore. That's gold. Uh, you know who also I believe is from Oroville is Jackson Pollock. I uh, I don't know that that's. I think he would have mentioned that. Are you sure? <laughs> I feel. I think that. I think that's true. I know that Guy Branham is from Yuba City. Uh, you uh, well, you know, at touchdown Guy Branham and I. He he uh, he and I were on the first. Time we, I ever got paid to do comedy was with uh, we came up in San Francisco at the same time. Oh, okay. I, I believe he he has roots in Minnesota and Yuba City. I believe. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. Because he got uh, one of the weird li- little fun facts about Guy Branham. He's done the program a couple of times. Uh, is that he got a full boat scholarship to the University of Minnesota Law School? Yeah. Which yeah, um, is not surprising if you know Guy Branham, but is also like what. Anyway, so yeah, he, uh, uh, from Yuba he, City. Yeah. Yeah, he uh, my brother went to University of Minnesota Law. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. Um but you're from fancy San Francisco. You know, uh well, I have yeah. I'm actually from uh, grimy San Francisco. I grew up in Haight Ashbury. Okay, that feels even more cred as opposed <laughs> to Lori Kilmartin who tells me she's from uh, San Francisco and then she grew up in Walnut Creek. And, like, yeah, a lot of silence. <laughs> a lot of silence. Well, 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 what? <laughs> yeah. like, I mean, she's that's a, a comic, I mean, for sure. 
she must even like in the privacy, like when doors are closed, acknowledge that that's a bit of a stretch. Oh, we do it publicly on our on my other podcast, the Jackie and Lori Show, where I openly say, "You keep saying that, but it's Walnut Creek," yeah. and um, it's like saying you're from Boston, but you're really from Worcester, Mass, and which is outside of Massachusetts. It's another town. It's, yeah, it's it, sort of a. I would say it's a it's a different continuum in the Massachusetts continual universe, you know. Yeah, and a lot of people make fun of Worcester. I don't mind Worcester myself. I actually uh, have played Walnut Creek. Uh, I'm not above anything, is what I'm saying. I've where'd been you play? Where did? Play yeah, where'd you play in Walnut Creek? The pool hall for Greg Osdorian. Oh, why see. wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Yeah, why, yeah. Why would you? Why would you say? Who doesn't want a hundred dollars on a Wednesday? Yeah, five, I mean, five years ago. Yeah. Well, and 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 also like, where'd you get the hundred dollars? Got it at the pool hall. I mean, that <laughs> never that never sounds anything other than cool. That's that's just good. That's just good dialogue there. That's good times. You were like, oh, there's 13 people that are kind of interested, and then another 30 that are genuinely playing pool. And then, <laughs> yeah, that like are are breaking some kind of laws in a variety of order. Yeah, and there's absolutely no way that that was somehow better than Zoom shows. Yeah. Oh, so, calm down. Can, can I tell you that this is just an, a little aside? The last time I played Walnut Creek, I did the I did a show at the Lesher Center. And I was doing this character named Guy Vaudeville, okay. and uh, I was, this was uh, and I was this was like uh, it was a Will Durst show, so we were like you know he greets Aww. the crowd afterwards, yeah. And, and we were sitting there, and, we, and this guy comes up to me with a little hat on, and he goes, "I'm so glad to see somebody doing vaudeville. My grandfather was a, he was a vaudeville great. It really it really hit home with me." And it was <laughs> like three generations of like little vaudeville guy like <laughs> there in walnut creek hat in hand or hat on head hat um on head. hat on head yes it's uh that is hilarious i i went all i know is i got to the pool hall gig early <laughs> and i had to find somewhere to eat and there was and i didn't want subway yeah. Like I didn't want Panera or Subway or, and that was right. all there was. And the only other thing that there was, was incredibly high, high upscale, like steak and sushi places. Yeah. So it that was is... like, that were also small chains, but small chains I'd never heard of, but sort of like hoping one day to be ocean air or something. And, um, it's not that Walnut, I mean. You can make fun of South Milwaukee, Wisconsin until I'm old and gray. I mean, it yeah, they, did, they, they did elect Paul Ryan, did they not? Uh, that's Janesville, Pete Lee's hometown. <laughs> sorry, sorry, not sorry, it. Sorry, not sorry. it. Sorry. You, know, sorry, you know what? My bad. No, sorry I brought it up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I do a joke. I used to do a joke about Paul Ryan. Looks exactly like the guy who date raped me in college. And I am not saying he did. I am just saying that he looks like the guy. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Did, anyway, the man provokes a response. Yeah. And that response is almost entirely negative. Uh, <laughs> dude's a haircut anyway. But so but the great thing about the San Francisco the history of San Francisco is that this seems to be kind of a turning point. This Pan American uh, pa Panama American. Yeah, there's sort of there's sort of I mean, it it it, le it all leads to stand up comedy, right? Because oh, does it? It, it always does because you get the Panama Pacific exhibition becomes a place. San Francisco develops this reputation as a place you can go to be an artist where artists are like can make a living, et cetera, et cetera. So it starts attracting artists. And, um, you know, there's the, the and then by, you know, 30 years later, there's this big artistic boom uh, in San Francisco. There was the, the Bay Area represented there. They, they were called the Bay Area represented uh, representational painters. And like they were all based out of North Beach and then like right almost at the same time is the Beats and the Beats and the painters are hanging out together. And then the, oh, the Beats start the beat hanging poets. out. The Beat the, Poets. Yeah, the Poets. Let me just uh, make some snapping noises. Yeah, okay. exactly. The Beat, <laughs> well, because Lawrence Ferlinghetti just died. Okay. Uh, yeah. I found, didn't kill him. Who is he? He is uh, founder of City Lights Books, which was oh. like, oh, Yeah. It's a place where all the beats hung out, you know? You know what? I think Greg Proops just did this program, and he might have mentioned that to me as well. But every time I, I am reminded of City Lights Bookstore, which I enjoy yeah. as a destination, but not as a place for me to buy books. Uh, because the last time I was there was right after, I think it was right after the election in 2016. And I walked in and I said, I need something light. And the woman behind the counter said the funniest thing. She said, 
we don't really do light. <laughs> yeah. And then I walked out. <laughs> yeah, no, they do. Yeah, they do dense. Yes, yes. The, it is it is uh, chock full of academia. You want to learn some things? The lightest thing is going to be a Howard Zinn thing. You want a little <laughs> people's history of the United States? Howard Zinn's your... And I like that book. That book is actually very well written as far as conversationally. Yeah. But it is also very de- dense. It is extremely dense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's sort of... Um, and it is not light. It is <laughs> no, no. It, it is, is not light. And I needed something light, and they did. And I liked, I liked her, her honesty. Yeah, I, I, I certainly, I, I, yeah, I, I love it when clerks are honest. Mm-hmm. I, I once went to, a, I once went to a, a record store in, uh, in Paris, and and I bought it, and I was like, your store is absolutely, it's great, it's so good. It was good. It was a great, a great store. Yeah. And, uh, this like. This like very hip Parisian woman just like puts down her, the records I bought and she goes, I know. And then continues. <laughs> right. She is aware. She is yeah. aware. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's funny. Um, that, that, that did you ever see the movie High Fidelity? You know, I haven't. I just you're, not, you're not missing a great deal. Okay. Uh, what you're just it's it's a super fun movie. It's it's um, John Cusack, uh, essentially the rich man's Paul Rudd, uh, or maybe the other way around. Can't tell. Anyway, but John Cusack essentially plays a guy who has two incredibly beautiful women, and uh, fighting over him, and a record store that he owns that. Uh, where he's, it's the coolest place in the world, and Jack Black works there. And uh, does he and choose the record store? What in the end does he choose the record store? I believe he does. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, a boy and his dog. <laughs> and so, but I think that um, it's, but it's such an interesting film because he has absolutely it's because it should have been not called high fidelity, but quality problems is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Cause there's absolutely nothing wrong with this guy's life, except for that. He's a bit of a sad sack and he can't pick. Uh, yeah. So, but there was, uh, there was instances of record mocking of the mocking of what, what you've chosen, which is like such a dumb thing to do. You know yeah, what I mean? It's, it's like- not inclusive at all. Yeah, it's like you you want you it's like you know what would only make my life better if I had someone else to like compare record collections with. So yeah. if you are doing that like what like what am I going to make fun of you? Like who the hell am I, you know? Right. Welcome to the Dork Forest. You guys, Arthur Gauss. I don't understand why you haven't been on the Dork Forest before cuz that is the attitude <laughs> we are looking for on this program. <laughs> and 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 mind you, I am quite quite dorky. <laughs> <laughs> and you should know this is that he has a new album out on 800 Pound Gorilla called Nice Jokes for Smart People. It could be you. You could be the people that he's talking to. Um so okay, so what else, like, did they do hot dogs? What else was at this expo? I mean, was it, was it, did it just blow your mind that it was so much, it made the art available? Well, it, it's, um, well, it, first of all, it worked. Like, oh, did it, it got people coming back to San Francisco. It was, okay. it was very much like San Francisco's back, baby. Yeah. And even though we have earthquakes and fire. Yeah. This will happen again, playa. <laughs> but like, while we're here, man. Just check it out, dude. (laughs) Look what they're doing with paint. (laughs) Yeah, look at what we're doing with paint. (laughs) It's gonna be amazing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And so, so, so. Okay. So, a couple of big things about it, right? The buildings from the Panama Pacific exhibition are uh, everywhere still. Everywhere. Okay. Um, The the like the Palace of Fine Arts is still up. The conserv the big Conservatory of Flowers in Golden Gate Park. Yeah. I think that, I believe that was built for the Panama Pacific exhibition. Okay, so this wasn't like this wasn't like a world fair where they kind of half ass put some things together. Like the the built to scale replica of the Parthenon is still in Nashville <laughs> from the World Fair, but like usually like nothing else. Like usually yeah. they build like one thing and they keep it. You're saying that they built several things. I mean they had space, I guess. Well, and they kept the neighborhood. It's just now the the marina is now um, is where, that's where the Panama Pacific exhibition was. Is that is it called the Esplanade? What uh, what is the marina? Is that different the, than the Esplanade? I mean, it's 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 the northernmost point of San Francisco. Okay. It's 
it is like sort of the hip place to be if you are extremely wealthy and young. Okay, but isn't that the entirety of San Francisco right now? To uh, some extent. I mean, it is not the same place I grew up. Let's, I mean, well, we can be perfectly frank about that, but, um, sure it is. And, and in some ways, like San Francisco has always been a place that sort of like attracts people who think they're going to make a fortune out West. Yeah. Um, there, there are, there's some resonance culturally with like doing that. Right. And everything changes. I mean, my hometown is not the same as it was when I was a little kid either. And, um, there's nothing there's nothing to be done about it. And 20 somethings with a giant bag of money are always going to, there's always going to be a change and there and the gentrification, there's a name for it now. Yeah. But it's always existed. Yeah. Know? And, 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 and that, but that's not to say there's two things about that is it's, it's true that it's always happened, but that doesn't like alleviate the injustice of it. And, um, particularly as it relates to the, you know, the, the disruption of, the, like the disruption of like communities that had been there for a long time, kind of right, regardless of circumstance, you know? Oh, you know what they did in Milwaukee? Uh, they took the highway system and they split the black community in half on yeah. purpose, it turns out. Because I don't know if you guys know this, white supremacy, not new, not new. No, no, and, no, no, uh, no, no. And no. on purpose. No, no. And that's, um, yeah, that, I mean, that, it, it's always been on purpose. They've always been trying this stuff. They'll just, all they'll, They'll be back in some other form, like right. this is, they're, but they're not these people, and this is what they do. They're not cutting Chinatown up, are they? Can you still go to Chinatown? For oh yeah, Chinatown? Well, yeah. Chinatown is still. I mean, look, like everywhere else in town, like it's until things are until this is over, it's all going to be you know up in the air. But um, but Chinatown, I, I I went to I went to grade school in Chinatown. Okay, and and it's 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 always going to be Chinatown. You know, it's. There, there would be some cosmetic changes, but these sort of changes happen. And, and, and also, you know, it's like, I feel the other thing that's sort of true about these sort of things is that like, uh, they're, inev they're, they're inevitable, but that doesn't alleviate the injustice of it. But it does sort of like, per, you know, sort of force people who've been here to preserve some of the ethos of it, you know, and, and like, to the extent that like people are talking about saving San Francisco, like which really to you keep it can really sound table, quite droning. What's up? You keep hitting the table, and yeah. uh, for and there's tiny emphasis because the tone of your voice doesn't go with you guys. It's so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah. I'm sorry. But the, the the point is that like it, it's 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 important for for that's why I'm sort of interested in the Panama Pacific exhibition is that like some of this stuff about being an artist and some of this stuff about like, you can do it here and you can be weird here and you can take, take chances here. Um, which I think is definitely a part of our like comedy culture here, like sort right. of has its origins in the Panama, some part of its origins in the Panama Pacific exhibition. Well, I mean, cause San Francisco, I think, I mean, the first th thoughts I have when it comes to San Francisco is it's sort of inclusivity. You know, that it's inclusive and that it that it wants you to be who you are, you know, and it wants it to open up. And, you know, the 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 shows that I've done in San Francisco, both Sketchfest and the Punchline yeah. and Cobbs and then like Mill Valley. Yeah. Are all so very different. Yeah. And but I think that there is even if you're a billionaire. There's a part of you that wants that, you know, e even those billionaire kids or the or the olds who are billionaires yeah. uh, who who come to the show. And it's so weird when a billionaire comes to a comedy show. I was like, I thought I would be brought to you on the backs of elephants. Yeah. Why? Why? Why have you come out of your home anyway? Uh, but the uh, but they it's because they actually do want there to be art and they well, do want it to be weird you know yeah i mean art is like it compels people you know and it's like why would a billionaire do anything other than like roll around in his own money you know yeah and order pizza mm -hmm. like why would he do that and it's like because he's looking for something greater and like i think art of any kind fulfills that need and so it's like when somebody <laughs> when somebody when somebody's like really really rich and they go to a comedy show and they look a little bit lost but then they're laughing like everybody else. Like, you know, they're, that's, that is, it, that's an aspect of inclusivity that, like, I think makes it um, so transcendent. And I think you we've know, always had that here. 
And it's it it is great, and 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 it's so funny that we're sort of being sympathetic to the billionaires of the world, who deserve very little sympathy, no. quite honestly. But uh, the but they are. It's not like they aren't human. They're just idiots. Yeah. No. It's it. Look, yeah. greed is greed is greed. But like inclusivity. But like if the the onus is on sane and reasonable and empathetic people to extend. The yeah. mantle of inclusive. It's it's our responsibility. You know what I mean? Like, right. It's as irritating as it is. I, <laughs> just but like, I have to be a decent person, even if you are a monster. Yeah. And and I'm going to fail. By the way, occasionally. Yeah. I've the last if the last four years have tra- t- taught me anything, is that uh, I am not going to take the high ground. If you take a very much the low ground. Yeah. I'm going to be a piece of shit as well. Right back at you. And, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to feel good about it though. I no, mean, it, it's, it's yeah. that feeling. It's that not feeling good about it afterwards that like, I think separates. Yeah. I think there's, I think that's a fault line. And I think that's like where sometimes you have to like make your, it's like, it can be, it's, and that it's like, that's going to be different for different people, you know? Sure. And like, um, but it's like, as long as the fault line kind of like comes along sane and reasonable, um, yeah, civilization. You can, you can make is, decisions. Yeah, and I, and I genuinely believe that c- civilization is inexorable. So, and and the 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 advances that we make in it are tiny. Yeah. Uh, and it is slow, but it is very very, and sometimes it's bigger. You know, so, sometimes there are upheavals, in in sort of glaciers and earthquakes. This type of uh, analogy. Uh, but there, but for the most part, civilization is very slow. Yeah. Now, this is one of the. This is this is sort of a really nice thing to sort of land on for the Panama Pacific exhibition because it was sort of this this east meets west meets, meets west thing, which is like very very strong in the imagery that's associated with it. It's like you know, there's these giant reliefs of like Europe, you know, moving ac- coming across the ocean and then becoming wagon trains and then arriving in California. And then from the east, like a bunch of eastern looking people to American eyes in 1915 and like San Francisco, you know, a giant Atlas figure is holding them apart, standing on San Francisco. That sort of imagery of east meets right. west and the, ex- the inexorable march of civilization was a big, 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 big theme. But one of the things that I think is really true about um uh, that we're realizing in, in our contemporary age is that it wasn't like a slow march of civilization towards barbarism on the other side. It was the slow march of a lot of different civilizations moving towards one another right. and, they, and arriving in San Francisco at the Panama Pacific exhibition of 1950 and get your tickets now, you know, get your tickets now. So what else, like, did they have panels? Was it, was it the first comic con? Like, was it just <laughs> art? What else, what else was, how was it, was it just, did they have technological tents yeah. and stuff like that? That's what I'm hoping. I was hoping that it was like a world expo where they were Yeah, like, it was like a world expo, but it was focused on art. So they had like different, you know, okay. gadgetry and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but it was, it was mostly about bring us your paintings and bring us your sculptures. Okay. Because we want to see them, baby. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, and actually, you know, it's funny if uh, there's there this is this inexorable march of civilization, um, like spreading out across the land. It that really has some nice resonance with the uh, one of the other things that sort of suggested to you, which is the 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 Athenian democracy. Right. Right. Because I I thought that that's where you were going to swap it over to, but we yeah we can talk about sort of the cradle of civilization in Western civilization was Athens. Right. And um, or it was when I went to grade school and junior high. Uh, I'm sh- and, and in other cultures, it was other things. But right. what was for you, fifth century uh, Athens <laughs> was a big fucking deal. What well, talk to me about this? Huge Why? deal. Huge deal. And, no, and like you got to hear me out on this, man. <laughs> like I, I so background. I uh, I was I minored in class. I was a major in history. I minored in classics. And mm-hmm. I am that, I just never stopped reading history. Like I never stopped. I, I just, I love it. I read. That's awesome. Um, and, and I, I, and my, I've always been interested in Greek history. So. Um, Did you take ancient Greek? Yeah, I, I can read it. I, uh, to this day, you can read it. Cause I took uh, Latin. I was going to study the classics and, and, uh, and they told me I was going to have to take ancient Greek. And I was like, 
Nah, I think I'll do stand up. Oh. I, yeah. Yeah. Look, I got to be honest with you, man. You missed you missed because Latin's the, bo- oh, Latin's sure. the boring one. Latin's the boring one. Yeah. Greek is like lots of people doing it. Oh, that's so funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. I bet you it's, it's a lot dirtier. Oh, interesting. Way. <laughs> <laughs> like the 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 um the Romans were like pornographic in yeah. kind of a, in kind of a gross way, mm-hmm. but the Greeks like um who they were also quite pornographic, but like but they were just polyamorous. Well, and they were also yeah. but they were doing it in dactylic hexameter, man. Like they they were, <laughs> they were getting all the way dorky with it. It's like, you know, when I, when I, sometimes when I look back on Chaucer and I think to myself, you guys are doing it in iambic pentameter. I don't, uh, I don't ever, I, that actually, I might be mixing my metaphors, but uh, the, <laughs> the weird or mixing my, my references. But the thing is, is so you took Latin, you took Greek and yes. you, uh, you studied history and thus, and, and, and ancient Athens kind of inspiring right? Yes. And well, it's, here's the thing. And this is this, and the, the, there's this big debate about like in, in classics now about like, should we just blow it up? Like, is it too overrun with like proud boy lights? Is it just, you know, is it just, is, is this whole thing about like that, you know, the Greeks and the Romans being the paragon of Western civilization? Is that, is that really about like, are we the best, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm here to tell you I've heard those. It's like and so and so it's important to remember, but I think the big change here that's sort of afoot is that people are realizing that like that at the same time that Athens was happening, other great civilizations were happening and they were all trading with each other. It was all happening, you know? Um but what makes Athens unique and and this period of Ath- of Greek history really unique is that what's clear to the Greeks of that era is that they believed their democracy made them strong and their democracy made them great. And okay. the reason why they were better than everybody else, and they were, <laughs> and they knew it, uh, was because of their awesome democracy. And it doesn't look anything like ours in a lot of ways. I was going to say, please define their democracy because it was very different. If it I was remember super correctly. different. Now, yeah. now, now, there are some similarities, right? There's some key similarities. So voting. People could do it. That's how they made decisions. They voted. And the qualifications? Um, there, it was like for certain positions, you had to be over 20 and male and a citizen. And for other, um, for other positions, you had to be over 30 and male. But it was always male citizens, which, you know, obviously. <laughs> right, right. And, and <laughs> it the- rings a little tin. Right, right. Well, and and always and always will. Uh, but yeah. the, but that doesn't mean it it wasn't real. But the uh, but th- you could vote if for certain positions if you were in your twenties, and you could vote for certain positions if you were in your thirties. Or you are you talking hold, about running for things? You could hold those positions. Right, right. No, no. I'm talking about the voting rights. Like, the voting. Who, who I got think got to vote. The the voting rights is the the universe of people who could vote is mostly males over twenty. Citizen over twenty. Over okay. 20. Yeah, I was wondering at the age. I knew it was male. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I will not be shocked. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't my first rodeo. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, exactly. You're never going to believe this, but they didn't let the women in. It was nuts, <laughs> you guys. And they had slaves. Weird. Yeah, you, anyway. I, now, listen, while you're sitting down, <laughs> let me tell you who built this sweet-ass Parthenon. <laughs> yeah, let's not blow your mind here, but yeah. it wasn't union labor, you guys. <laughs> yeah, right. It was not, it was not union labor. Um, but, it, but those, but those sort of things are instructive too, is that like, remember that like, who, who actually built these great civilizations? It's a lot of people who didn't get the credit. And, um, but the, the, the whole notion is that they, they had some really interesting concepts about democracy that were specific to Athens and that were like specific to sort of the Athenian, cause there were other city states in Greece that had like varying forms of democracy. But like for the Athenians, it was like, you know why we're the tightest is because we're our democracy is the best. And, and this whole idea of like, you know, only a few people could vote because only a few people were citizens. It was it was tied necessarily to, to some idea that you had to have some skin in the game that like they because there was this distinction in the, in the Athenian imagination between Andres, like citizen people and hoi polloi. Which is like hoi polloi is like, that's like the people who overrang the capital. It's like who even who even cares what they think? You know, it's like they're just 
barbarians, you know? Uh, so the there were citizens and there were barbarians. Yeah, be, well, and there how, were citizens how, and then there's people who, whose interests didn't matter because they didn't have any... They didn't have any skin in the game. What's what do you define the skin in this game? They they were not landowners. Yeah, they didn't own land. They didn't have a business. They didn't have um, they didn't have some sort of economic interest um, in the functioning of the city. I think is sort of how they might describe it, um, and that's sort of like what what um, what sort of distinguished between resident of Athens and citizen of Athens who had to participate in the democracy, what which is the, another thing they the regarded population? as kind of compulsory. They regarded what as compulsory participation. Like you had to do it. Right. Like it was um, like jury duty every day kind of thing. Um, well it's, it's, so what was the population of Athens in the fifth century? About 30,000. Okay. And how many citizens were there and how many residents were there? Oh, well, actually, no, I think it was like there was, there was, it's something like there were 30 to 40,000 people in the city and about, about, tw- about, I think it was like 20,000 of them were citizens. So don't quote me. If I get angry emails from classics professors later, like, first of all, my life first would get all, way, way better. That's so awesome. You're just like, do you want to talk about this for an hour? Please teach, <laughs> yeah, like, teach me this again. I knew yeah, it I'm once. Like, yeah, I'm like, thank yeah. you. For your email, <laughs> I would like exactly. to discuss further. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a classic. It's a classic moment. But it's, you know, because there's so, there's, because I think what I'm, what I'm getting is that you love the ideals of it. Yeah, it, totally. And like, I like the idea of, I like the way they valued it, for sure. And okay. that they regarded it. And And here's another thing that they discovered, because... It's, it was very, it was not, it was the opposite of in- inclusivity for a long time uh, in, in, in the Athenian democracy. Um, however, when the chips were on the table and they had to like fight the Persian war and they had to figure out how they were going to drive off like a Persian force that like outnumbered them like 10 to 1. Right. They realized that like, well, we're going to have to make a lot more people citizens. And it yeah. was, they, they established the Navy and they basically said, if you, first of all, you have to join the Navy. If you're a male um, over any, any fighting age male, sorry, man, you're in. Mm-hmm. Um, however, when this is all over, you will be a citizen. If you live uh, with service comes citizenship. Right. And uh, yes, Heinlein. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, and, and that's where Heinlein got it from because it is, it's, a, it's, an, old, it's an old template for citizenship. And it's, um, but I love the ideals of people that they're like, these, these are, these are rights, you know, these are inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right. And, and the, the Pericles in his famous funeral oration specifically talks about, uh, like sort of freedom of discourse and like individual and like the individual rights. Yes, because the individual is such such a big deal in in Greek philosophy back then, and which is one of the one of the things that we did embrace so greatly. But it's so it's so interesting to it's it's like it's like any art to go back to your Panama America thing, is that you ha- there there are these people with these great ideals Thomas mm-hmm. Jefferson, um, Pericles uh, these and and they have. Their hearts are in the right place. Yeah. But they also want to fuck a 15 year old. And yeah, apparently like Pericles, his big first, like his first big political feud um, against Aristides, like maybe possibly originated over the affections of like a teenage boy. Sure. Um, sure. That's, that's, that's in the record. Um, so it, you, the, and, but that's one of the things that I make, thinks makes classics so interesting is that these like great, brilliant men were like, also these venal creeps, you know, and, and actually prone to just like stupidity and bouts of folly. And it's sort of instead of showing that like ancient Greek civilization and their ideals was better than everybody else's. It's more like the, the real lesson is that like these great people were also prone to the same frailties and they created institutions that were prone to the same frailties. And so a little bit of humility would be nice every once in a goddamn while. <laughs> right, right. And, and the civilization I speak of is the fact that, you know, we, we and, and it's a lot faster now, right, society? Right. 
so way faster. You write, you write your treaties. Mm-hmm. You talk about the in, injustice that is happening, right? And then someone says, "Oh, but you, you know, make all of your money by selling post its that are made by toddlers in you know on Eleventh Street." And so you can respond to, you're like, well, this is the ideal. The treaties is the ideal. I'm not going to be living like that. I'm going to have a slave and I'm going to uh, rape things. And, uh, but, but the thing is, is so where we're at now is because those minds still exist, right? Those, yeah. but those men and women are still coming up with, you know, built on the shoulders of, of these, these published works from yeah. the fifth century. Yeah, yeah. And also, one thing to always bear in mind about the classics is we only have these texts, thank you very much, thanks to the efforts of some non-Europeans, and thanks to the exclusive efforts, almost, of non-Europeans, who realized that the ancient Greeks were onto something, and when a bunch of people, and when these texts were being burned, they preserved them, right. and then gave them back to us, just because they were being nice. Um, Which, you know, and you think about uh, the Elgin marbles. But the, uh, <laughs> but, so who... Who was it? Um, was it the Arabs and from North Africa who took who took a lot of their stuff? You know, it's so. This is this is where I'm. This is where it starts to like the specific geographical location starts to get a little hazy. But we're but I believe, and again, don't quote me on this, unless like classics professors out there, feel free. <laughs> feel right. free. You feel free to email hate. and tell us because this I, is just. But this I is believe, all half membered. It's yeah. Awesome. I believe that this is that the this was like these texts came into the hands of uh, Arabs and then Persians who already knew a lot of the mathematical concepts sort of independently. Like they already kind of understood that the Greeks were correct, but had come about it from a different way. And 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 then I I believe like and again don't quote me on this, but this is like an expert in the, one of the experts in these texts was Leo Africanus who became. Like he he became like a you know homeboys with the Pope, and like brought back a lot of these and these Greek and Roman texts into European society, and that's when we have the Renaissance. Right. There was uh, I think um, name of the rose by Umberto Eco is historical uh, historical fiction, and uh, the great thing about Umberto Eco is that uh, that's a guy who does do all of his research. I mean that and he passed away I think about last year or two years ago. But um, his, um, I think he did, uh, but his, uh, but his historical fiction, and he wrote about the name of the rose and the reintroduction of Aristotle into uh, the the post Dark Ages uh, after right. the Middle Ages, and um, Africanus was a big deal in that. And then, because I remember, there's another ooh, Arthur Gauss, by the way. Uh, every, everyone should uh, maniac underscore bowl. 800 pound gorilla yes. album called nice jokes for smart people. You, uh, nobody wants to read this book ex- unless they do. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Huh? Is I that, got, yeah. Okay. I, nobody wants I, to I have, a, I, have <laughs> I have a fiction novel that, uh, that is historical fiction that might be adorable. It's essentially Raiders of the Lost Ark, but it is written and it is set during the Middle Ages, and it's about a guy who leaves Ireland and join wow. and on the sea, and he's like fourteen, thirteen or fourteen, or it might be Wales, whatever. It's and it's in the British Isles. Yeah, it's rocky UK. It's rocky UK. His castle has been burned. Uh, you know, his uncle or his cousin has killed his you know father or or killed his mother, and uh, he's got to go find his father who is a spice trader, uh, and he discovers, um, the civilized world in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, when Europe was were eating their own shit. Yeah, I and, mean, who knows yeah. what we were doing? Whatever we did, we didn't write it down, man. And it was gross. It was foul. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he he took a trip this uh, in in this book to North Africa, and so and then to um, China and uh, the Orient, and so it is called the Walking Drum, and okay. it is a book by Louis L'Amour. the guy who wrote cowboy books that Ronald Reagan loved. Uh, I've read them all. Mostly because I used to shoplift books when I had uh, uh, some problems at the at the library. Uh, I had a fine. <laughs> I couldn't pay the fine. Yeah. So uh, I had to steal books from Kmart. And once you start stealing books from Kmart, uh, what you're allowed to read uh, gets uh, real narrow real quick. 
Yeah. So uh, all the Louis L'Amour novels. I've read them so, all. So you were. So you, do you do you believe that this was because you were stealing Louis L'Amour novels? Mm-hmm. And which, first of all, top flight name, Louis L'Amour. <laughs> um, you were stealing Louis L'Amour novels, and do you think that like some like <laughs> right leaning supervisor saw you doing it and was like? Now let her go. It's time for her to learn. <laughs> uh, I think everyone who were, who's ever worked at a Kmart <laughs> really has to, you really have to be a self-starter if you're going to care about the shoplifting situation at Kmart. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah. How far are you willing to go to save that toothbrush, man? Right. It's 1977. You're making <laughs> three bucks, four bucks an hour. It isn't good. Uh, I'm stealing Harlequin romances and Louis L'Amour novels <laughs> yeah. so, and a bunch of mercenary like action novels set in Africa. Uh, yeah, there was literally, they had like three different kinds of books. They had like actiony <laughs> kind of books that were Westerns and, and soldier books, soldier of mm-hmm. fortune books. And then they had romance novels. And well, I mean, yeah. right. I mean, you can see so that I was like, in some of the same strings, you know? Right. Well, they're all, it's all pulp. It's all just, you know, and, and there was, you know, mediocre sex in all of them. Oh, so, see. uh, but they were all about 220 pages and could fit into my back pocket. <laughs> so, and that's enough. Yeah. And the joke's on me really, because, um, they were so addictive that I stopped reading nonfiction. For a long time. I mean, so and, wait, what kind of nonfiction did you read? Uh, I was reading, well, it was mostly history. It was, uh, I really liked the French and Indian War and the Civil War. <sighs> when, uh, starting in junior high. Uh, well, uh, grade school and junior high. So Man, it, the, you want to talk dorkdom. Like, yeah, I do. <laughs> like, I do want to talk. That's oh, what we're man. doing here, man. Like, well, I mean. We've waited like, off. Yeah, Go Ken ahead. Burn, yeah, Ken Burns couldn't keep it under 30 hours. <laughs> I mean. Right. Right. And it's, and it's, and it's whatever he is vaguely interested in. It's a 30 hour thing on jazz or baseball or the civil war or the national parks. It's yeah. yeah. Just to be clear, I could do, and <laughs> that is like, the, that's, that's some dork. Have you I can seen relate to that kind of dork. You know what have, I mean? Ha- have you seen those or? Oh yeah. I've, I've, I, I watched the prohibition one on my honeymoon. I mean, like if it's, if it's a dense, fact heavy narration plain documentary like non buzzy documentary i haven't done country music okay yet. did he do country music as well yeah he did country music a lot of pan and scan there oh uh, yeah and he, I, I, how was I, prohibition superb what did you learn about prohibition that i might not know oh my goodness um so prohibition like here's one thing that i i learned from, and this is a big one because I think that this has informed everything that I've thought about prohibition since then. Um, and that is like, don't forget that like America definitely had a huge drinking problem. And that is no friggin' joke. Like they said that the average American was taking down nine gallons of whiskey a year. Okay. Has that gone away? Nine gallons? Like, I mean, uh, that's a that's an incredible amount of whiskey. Math not being my super, uh, not one of my dorkdoms, not one of my. I don't know how much whiskey that is a day. What's nine well, gallons into three hundred and sixty five days? Yeah, I mean, think about like there's sixteen ounces in a. You're talking about draining, 32. like a like a handle of whiskey. Mm-hmm. Like you're talking about doing more than one of like almost a little less than one of those a month, which means that like you're pouring yourself a lot of whiskey. Every <laughs> single yeah, no, it's a lot of whiskey. I, I agree. A gallon of whiskey. Uh, how, how many fluid ounces are in a gallon? Do we remember offhand? Is it uh, see four? metric system? Not one of my dorkdoms. Uh. <laughs> no, that would be English. And uh, but the thing, so, um, Hey Siri, how many ounces are in a gallon? It's a podcast, you guys. We're all in this one together. One gallon is 128 fluid ounces. Okay. Uh, how many ounces are in nine gallons? How many ounces are in nine gallons? 1,152 fluid ounces. Okay. So 1,100. Uh, here, here's my favorite thing about the Dork Forest is that there's a ranger going, I knew that. 
Now, I, I assume you're about to do math, Jackie, and, uh, <laughs> and I know it's happening out there. Gentlemen, ladies, uh, I know that you're out there going, it's fine, Jackie. It's a lot of whiskey. Just accept his, his what he Just said. accept the premise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, um, right. I mean, but it, it's it might a, be it's three ounces a day. It might be three ounces of whiskey a day. And so that's three shots. Well, and that's leaving aside, um, beer, that's first of all, the wine. average American, that's, that's beer, wine, anything it's like, that's just your whiskey. Can, mm-hmm. so you're drinking, you're drinking like whiskey every, it's like, it's, it's a staple item at the grocery store. Right. It? So, and like there were, a, there was a lot of attendant problems. Like there was, there was a broad <laughs> conclusion that like this, that like, there were just too many drunk young men around. And as a person who has been around a lot of drunk young men, I can say that there are always too many drunk young men around. <laughs> right. like, even even when there was prohibition, the drunk young men, they might have gone down, but two, two is too many drunk yeah, young men. Yeah, two is too many. I, you, know what is, you know what is my number, like my preferred number of drunk young men around? Zero. Big goose egg. Yeah, big, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a, lot, a lot of nothing. Yeah. So, but anyway, so there was this big, it was, it, there was basically a lot of, there, there was starting to like, there, there was just too many people getting drunk and, and getting involved in domestic violence incidents, losing their money and being involved in gambling, that sort of thing. Um, and so this temperance movement sprung up and it was kind of, it was like, it was in some ways a very organic movement. And in some ways, like you can, I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous basically started like, during the t- during the drunk years of like American society, that like a couple guys met in Baltimore, and it was because like they needed to find another way, and that was uh, that was aligned a little bit with the temperance movement. Okay, so the te- so w- when did when did it become illegal to buy and sell alcohol in the United States? Do you remember? Uh, Nineteen eighteen, I think. Okay, and, and then the- repealed in twenty nine. I. I feel like repealed in 29, but then like beer, it was like they brought beer and wine back first. Sure. And then they, then they're like, okay, you, you can have the hard stuff. Yeah. And like, I think in like, it was like full repeal in like 31 or 32. Right. Because so they had a problem with public drunkenness and with the drinking problem in general. And then, so they created prohibition so that they, then they had a problem with organized crime. Yes. They had a problem with organized crime. But they also had... There once was an old woman who ate a fly. I don't know why she ate the fly. Perhaps she'll die. Mm-hmm. And uh... Yeah, exactly. It was, it, was, it, was, it was just one problem following another. And, well, and also that, like, it was... It was also just too... They realized it was too great of a pi- price to pay, including, like, politically. Like, people started running on, like, I'm bringing back beer. You know? Right, right. And you're going you're gonna to get votes on that. Yeah. Please believe sure. you're going to get votes on yeah. that. No, 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 you, no you're, from, you're from Milwaukee. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Like, you're getting votes on that. I was weaned on Pabst and Ho-Ho's. So there's no, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. And, and yeah, and weird thing about alcohol, because I was wondering about pro- Prohibition is that Alcoholics Anonymous was founded in 1939. So um, it started in 1935, but it, the book came out in 1939, and it became national. So, and it started in Akron, Ohio. But um, yeah, I, so I then we're talking about a different temperance organization. But one of the big ones, and so I, you know, forgive me for for getting the organization wrong. That's and, right. But I the, uh, but it's there was a there was a a different temperance. Maybe it was the Temperance League. But so it was the, yeah, there was there was huge temperance leagues. And yeah, things. and it was like it was like just a couple of people who wanted to dry out and right. And I think AA was a response to well, that didn't work. <laughs> right. I'm making bathtub gin and drinking my fool head off, and everyone's mad at me when I say no one should drink. <laughs> you know, the other thing is that there, like, there was that I learned from is that so there were some really amusing ways that people found their way around because there was a religious exemption of prohibition. You could still have wine with communion, for example. Oh, okay. And you could still have ceremonial wine, like Manischewitz, if mm-hmm. uh, for you know Passover, etc. Right. And um, and then there were certain medicinal ex- exemptions, 
And like, uh, again, going back to San Francisco, like Fernet is one because it's like a digestive. And so people drink Fernet and it's, it's ghastly, but, um, people drank it. And, uh, the, the, but the, the, there were all these exemptions and then you could, people just started selling things where all you had to do was like pour water on it. Like there was like, there were like grape, you know, grape kits that had instructions like, you know, warning, do not fill with water and sugar and leave in a dark place kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, oh, fermentation kits. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's interesting. Pruno. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is interesting. How? Well, I have to tell you, because we took a break, I have no idea how much time we've been talking, but I'm sure it's an hour. I've got 63 minutes yeah. and a half. Right. So we did it. We wandered around and we dorked out about so many different things. So many. I, so many things. I think on the, on the whole, we're going to say Arthur Gauss is a, a, a San Francisco dork. That's what we're going to say. Oh, uh, I'm a, a guy. San Francisco dork. Right. A man who <laughs> enjoys the place he grew up in, which is a rare thing. So uh, embrace that, Arthur. Yeah, I, I guess maybe I did kind of hide the ball on my 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 one and true North Your Star true door. true love. It's true. Yeah. Um, but everybody, you should find uh, Arthur Goss on the on the Internet. It's Adrian Pong Gorilla has a, a new album out by him called Nice Jokes for Smart People. His name is Arthur Goss, G-A-U-S. And his uh, Twitter handle is at Maniac underscore Bowl, like Super Bowl, yeah. but Maniac Bowl. Yeah, Maniac With, Bowl. Yeah. And that is that Twitter, Instagram, and all the things. Yeah, it's uh, Twitter. Uh, no, I don't. I don't have a Facebook. Huh. But um, yeah. Yeah. Twitter, Instagram, and those are TikTok the TikTok or I don't know me TikTok. No, I'm I'm not an especially good dancer. Okay, and uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for doing the show, Arthur. Uh, Jackie, thank you so much for having me. All right, and Rangers, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> My hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. Thank we you. Why don't we just call that as the end of the show?